hey y'all, welcome back to Outside the Room. I'm CG Funk and I'm your host. And it is so wonderful to connect with you again through this show. And I'm super glad you joined me on this journey. Now before we get started, I wanted to thank Massage Heights, who is our exclusive sponsor for this podcast and virtual show. Massage Heights truly understands the work you provide every day is special and is committed to creating culture of care environments where massage therapists, estheticians, and support staff can thrive. Please visit www.massageheights.com forward slash careers to learn more. Now we have a great surprise for you today. James Waslowski is in the studio and we will be talking with him live in a few minutes. Now James Waslowski, a very special guest. He has over 30 years of expertise in manual therapy and teaches over 45 seminars every year all over the world. He's a published author and a renowned international lecturer. His classes are attended by chiropractors, athletic trainers, osteopaths, physical therapies, physicians, certified personal trainers, and by wonderful massage therapists. James is a certified personal trainer with the National Academy of Sports Medicine, and his textbook, Clinical Massage Therapy, A Structural Approach to Pain Management, was published by Pearson Publishing in 2011. And I couldn't be more thrilled to welcome James Wislowski live here in the studio to Outside the Room. Welcome, James. Well, I am so pleased to introduce you to James Waslowski. James, this is so exciting having you in the studio today. How are you? Siji, I'm great. It's an honor to be here with you because you're also a mentor of mine. So I, what a privilege to be in this room with you. Today. Oh my God. And you're the first live person we've had on Outside the Room. So this is quite a milestone for us. And thank you for coming from Dallas. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. <laughs> well, let's get right into it because you have a lot to share. And I know our audience wants to hear um, a lot from you. So first of all, I always love to start like this in the beginning. I like to start in the beginning mm -hmm. because there's always great stories of what motivates people to decide to become a massage therapist or get into the massage or skincare mm -hmm. professions. And you have a pretty interesting story about why you became a massage therapist. So share that with us. So CG, right out of high school, I became an EMT to pay my way through college, junior college. And then I became a paramedic, which I worked out of emergency rooms and hospitals and taught like since I was 18 years old. So I took massage as a hobby, believe it or not. I thought I'm gonna dabble, because I was a marathon runner. So I, I got sports massage. And, and then all of a sudden, I, as a hobby, shows up one of the world leaders in sports massage, Benny Vaughn. And he shows up in my, and while I was a student, I'm like going, I want to be like that guy. I, <laughs> like I was really, this guy had done Olympic athletes, professional athletes. He worked at the University of Florida. I was like blown away. And I go, I want to be like this guy. And, and Benny was so influential in my career. I decided to take more training and more studies. And, and all of a sudden the evolution of my career changed. I shifted gears. And, and what really pivoted me from being a paramedic for like 18 years and being and working in hospitals and fire departments was I was chosen by Benny to go to the Olympics in Atlanta in 1996. So I got out of school in 1990. 1996, Benny said, I've got you a venue. You can stay at Emory University. You can work with the gymnastics team. And my fire captain wouldn't let me off. So I had, I had to get three to four weeks off. I had, I had all the, I had everything I needed. I had vacation time, sick time. He said, I'm not gonna let you off. So I said, yeah, I gotta make a decision here. So I, I just retired. I totally retired in 1996, right before the Olympics. Went to the Olympics in Atlanta. That was one of my visions and my dreams when I was younger doing massage. And then that just skyrocketed into a whole new career. Like it was like um, unbelievable. I knew my purpose. I knew my passion. It was amazing. It's interesting though, because you hear, you know, different people <clears throat> that have been around the industry for 20 years, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And there, a lot of them have that point in time yeah. where they're where they're just they, they they to make the decision to go for it or not to go exactly. for it and exactly. i have a feeling that we've lost a lot of uh, massage therapists and estheticians that could have been masters and could have grown in their career in the, at the point that they were in decided not to go for it so i love hearing that because it's very inspirational and it's like you took this leap of faith out of a job that was pretty um uh, secure and you know you probably had retirement and benefits exactly. and all of that Everything. and you took this yes. 
crazy jump to go, no, I'm going to go all in with that. So that's really an amazing story. So you were a teacher um, as a paramedic. I know that you shared that information with me, of, you know, about teaching at hospitals and, you know, teaching um, in medical facilities. Mm -hmm. But you made the jump to teaching massage at some point in your career. And did you start as a teacher assistant first and then moved in to teaching? Or did you just decide one day after you left your career as a paramedic and did the Olympics, was that just a natural transition to put classes together and teach? Like, how did that all happen? It was really a natural transition because I already had that visual, kinesthetic, learning, auditory combination of how to learn and process. So as a therapist, then I would take certain classes. And again, if it's just lecture, demo, I couldn't process the information. So I'm thinking, I'm going to inspire students. I'm going to motivate them. I'm going to teach the way their brain process. I'm going to connect. Like, like if I get on the table first when I'm in a seminar, I feel it kinesthetically. I can beat it back. And when we're doing work, the, the beautiful transition was, one, I'm passionate about teaching. I get an endorphin high every time I get to help a student go, aha, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm smart enough. I'm good enough. And just inspire these students because growing up and not feeling smart enough in grade school, high school, and junior college, and so on, I thought, if I could just tap into their heart, if I could tap into their potential, their gift, their passion, and then make it fun and make it, you know, mm -hmm. teaching involves positive, loving, constructive feedback. Not That's not good enough, or you're doing it wrong. So I learned how to teach and motivate at the same time. And I, so I think that the transition was, when I watched Benny Vaughn teach, who was the world leader in sports massage, I thought, God, he's so animated and he's so, you're using stories. And I, I actually one time interviewed Jack Canfield, the author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, and he was animating these stories. And, and people just got into it. And they, when they made it fun, the humor, the laughter, the dopamine production that when we can have when I make you laugh in a seminar then the brain just processes information. So I wanted to be a teacher that didn't teach traditional model of teaching, where you read a book and take a test and you listen to a lecture because I just couldn't process information. That it's, way. it's really interesting that you bring that up because I don't know if you know this, and maybe our audience doesn't know this about me, but I was a teacher for years uh -huh. in massage schools, yeah. in a particular <clears throat> school. And, um, and one of the classes I was given was cranial sacral therapy because I had taken um, a lot of training mm -hmm. in that in the 90s. And so, but I would go to these trainings of cranial sacral therapy and I'd sit in this room and I'd be like, I don't even know what the heck they're talking about because they use the, the people that were sharing the information mm -hmm. or trying to teach were not teachers. And teachers is, is so I learned teaching by watching what I didn't think worked and then morphed it into what I did exactly. think. Like I would go to, I took probably, I don't know, five different, you know, I have 500 hours of cranial sacral mm -hmm. training. And, um, and I would go and I, every teacher I'd say, what is cranial sacral therapy? And none of them could give you a straight answer, like just two sentences of mm -hmm. what it is. They would go on and on about the cerebral spinal fluid or the dura moving or yeah. whatever, yeah. but they couldn't say, this is it. And so... When I was preparing to teach that class, I go, I have to figure out how I can simplify this, teach the techniques the way yeah, the flow goes, exactly. but simplify the information so that people get it because I was lost exactly. for like a, all those workshops. Yeah. And so it's really interesting because I have a feeling that, that we're, we're similar like that, where it's like, okay, here's the concept. Yeah. And then I had a, a, uh, one of my mentors told me the best teachers, Hugh Milne was one of my mentors, and he said the best teachers are ones that can take the most difficult information and teach it as simply as possible. And so I have a feeling that you bring some of that into your classes. What I love, CG, is that when we combine like teaching models and we put, there's, there was a study done that the thoughts we give energy to communicate to every cell in our body, it's a little bit changing our DNA. So if I can put positive thoughts in your mind and I can teach the way your brain wraps around it and I can combine that visual kinesthetic auditory style and you can feel it and you can see it and you can do it and I can make it fun and passionate, then all of a sudden people are like, this is fun. This isn't like going to college. This is like a total different, some of my university professors, I eventually taught them 
educational stuff. Like one of my my uh, organic chemistry professor at Lake Region Junior College, he ended up taking my he goes, I like your style of teaching. The way you present it is very different. And yet I struggled in his class because I just, again, I can't read a book, take a test, watch a video and put it on paper, but I can animate it and, and I can experience it. And I think it's visceral. It's like there's just this passion that happens when you see that light bulb go off. And these students are like, oh, I can get this. It's, it's really interesting because as, a, as an instructor or a teacher of massage, skincare, kinesthetic professions, right? Exactly. These are hands-on. Exactly. It's not just teaching the technique. Like, you're not just there teaching the technique. You're also teaching them how to talk about it to their, their clients. Yeah. And that's a whole other realm. So if you're using big fancy words and these long paragraphs to yeah. describe, those people are not going away with the verbal skill set of being able to tell a client, this is what it's going to do for you. This mm -hmm. is why you need it. So it's more than the techniques that, that you're teaching. And, um, and I see that you're giving your, your students the confidence yeah. to be able to actually speak about exactly. it as well as do it. Exactly. So you've had some pretty unique teaching experiences internationally. Um, just talk about a couple of your favorites. You know, CG, I've, I've been able to travel to about a dozen or so countries and, and teach osteopaths and chiropractors and physical therapy, you know, and, and train with them in Europe and Australia, all over the world. But I think some of my fondest memories are going to Australia. You know, I proposed to my wife in Sydney at the Sydney Opera House. So going to Australia, interacting with the, the people of the country and learning the way that they pr process information. I think, you know, I've had, oh my God, you know, Maui is local, but but to, to go there and teach and swim with the dolphins and make it experience. And so my teaching is really a journey of passionate travel. So so I never just go to a country and teach for a weekend and fly back. I, I stay for five days and I might go to Bali, Indonesia, or I might go to Fiji, or I might go somewhere else. And so I think the teaching has become a journey of my bucket list. It's all of a sudden, it's not just e teaching. It's, yeah. it's you know, when I taught at the Olympic Training Center in Sydney, Australia, prior to the 2000 Games, I loved it because the physios and the, everybody was working together. And so my biggest passion is why aren't they playing nice like that in the United States? You know, we had turf wars between colleagues and, and my vision was I want everybody on the same page. I want the chiropractor, the physical therapist, athletic training, osteopath. I want them to be integrating their, their strengths because we all have strengths. Our strength is soft tissue rebalancing, scar tissue work. A chiropractor is good at spinal mobilization techniques. And I wanted to bring that together because people were falling through the cracks of our system and the medical system. It was sort of broken. You go to one doctor, they'd say this, you go to another doctor, they say this. And I wanted to really have greater communication, greater collaboration, greater respect amongst the colleagues. And so as I taught internationally at the Olympic Training Center in Sydney, they were all working together for the best interest of, of those athletes in the 2000 Olympic Games. And I think that the other international travels, you know, we, we talked about Scott in India, and, and there's so many touching stories where we're doing some outreach and we're talking at universities. And, and at the same time, I'm still the student. I'm always the student because they're, have you thought about this? Have you twisted it this way? And I'm always like, wow, there's this transition where I can be better. You know, I'm, I'm in my 60s, but in my 80s, I want to be better than I am now. I want to be more passionate, more enthusiastic, and more knowledgeable, and more open to integrating the change of face of manual medicine. I love that. And, you know, we know that in the United States that we have an issue with massage therapists, the perception of massage being considered mm -hmm. lower than other interventions, even other complementary or alternative interventions. It's like they do, oh, well, there's chiropractic yeah. and naturopathic, <clears throat> then acupuncture, yeah. then, then da da da, <clears throat> and then here's the massage therapist. When in reality, everybody's on this even level and they all have different gifts and different things that they can contribute to support mm -hmm. the well being <clears throat> you know, of human beings. Um, so that's re it's really interesting to me. You know, one thing when I went to Kuwait, 
It was blown there by the, the surgeon requested me to release the shoulder. They've been locked up for like maybe 12 years. And they had so much respect for us. I mean, I, I was scheduled to teach 300 surgeons, prehab, rehab, prevention of shoulder surgeries in Dubai in 2020. And then, of course, COVID hit. But, but the respect I had amongst the high government officials in Kuwait, the respect I had from the physiotherapists in Kuwait, the respect I had from the top short surgeon in the world for shoulders goes, we really admire what you're bringing, but the fact that I had to go halfway around the world to bring it back to our U.S. surgeons was a really uh, wake-up call. It is, it was and a it's it's call. it's really interesting that you were telling me that story a little bit. You know, last night mm -hmm. I got to have dinner with James. It was That's very awesome. nice, and you were telling me that story about how um, the the surgeons in Kuwait that you talked, this top guy that you talked mm -hmm. with, really <laughs> said something about. In most cases, they sh there should never be shoulder surgery he because that, there's so many interventions you can well, do. One of the things he said, and that, I, that research has proven over and over and over, is that when we get a rotator cuff injury, when we mobilize it, the scar thickens, it be, the shoulder can't move, that the rehab, prehab, rehab phase without microcurrent, without prevention, without... He was really into... He turns away, Dr. Ali turns away... 50% of the clients that request soft tissue repairs of rotator cuff. He goes, when you balance the muscles and get the brain thinking freely about healing and really triggering the frontal cortex neuroplasticity in the brain, the body, when we put it back into balance, has the innate wisdom to heal itself. And so in many cases, he said, I turn away 50% of the requests for soft tissue repairs because they don't need it. They need the muscles balanced. They, they need what we do as massage therapists, balance the muscles, treat the scars, get the brain motivated to start thinking healing thoughts. And all of a sudden, I mean, I'm not the healer. I, I facilitate the body's innate wisdom to heal itself through motivational speech, through up, uplifting conversations and through restructuring. And I've studied with many of the masters in the world in all fields from osteopathic to chiropractic. So as we blend them and then we put the body into a healing state, getting rid of upregulated sympathetic stress and getting into that calming mode, stimulating the vagal nerve. Um, I believe that in what I love about massage and, and uh, aestheticians is that human touch, as, as some of my colleagues talk about, create different chemicals in the brain for depression, anxiety, healing. And when we can get out of that sympathetic stress, which happened in 220 more than ever before, I, Ashley Montague said, when babies were deprived of human touch, their brains never fully developed. And I met him through Dr. Tiffany Fields. And when humans were deprived of human touch in 220, there was more depression, anxiety, suicide, pain. Pain levels were skyrocketing. Even though your pain might be a three, it's a nine because we're multiplying the fears and the anxieties and, and, the, brain, and the brain controls everything. It's, it's really interesting. I, for me, when I, when I think about that, all of that too, the thing that massage therapists really, the special thing they bring to the table is they look at the body holistically. Mm -hmm. So it's not like in medical, they're like, oh, shoulder, the problem must be in the shoulder, right? It's not. Sometimes yeah. the side of pain is not the side of dysfunction. Most often. And so you were talking about working on the person in Kuwait with the shoulder issue, but you were talking about the scoliosis in their spine and there was mm -hmm. a they had a problem with the drop foot and mm -hmm. so and it was resetting all of that to help relieve the pressure in in the shoulder area and, and it was important to balance the hips and balance the shoulders and balance the occiput and look globally because most people have had accumulative injuries over a lifetime so this scar is pulling you this way and this joint imbalance is pulling you this way so if we don't look at the body globally and we just treat one body part and we don't treat it with positive conversations. And I'm not going to point out, oh my God, you have a rotator cuff injury, you need surgery. I'm going to point out, you're going to feel amazing. You're going to feel so, you get the VIP period. Once you walk in the room, the VIP, the, the words we use, the, the conversation, we redirect the brain to go, wow, I can do this. I can heal this condition. And that's what you teach. Like you teach from that place. So the exactly. students are learning the techniques. And these aren't students in school. These are, are professional massage therapists. Uh -huh. I, so they're, or osteopaths or yeah. whoever you're teaching, they're, they're learning the technique. They're learning how to speak about the, the modality or the technique. Uh -huh. And then they're learning interaction with the client to, um, to affect the way they think yeah. in a very subtle way. Yeah. So to me, that's a beautiful way to, to teach. No wonder you're so popular and you're traveling all over the world. Thanks. And no wonder <laughs> you've received numerous awards in your career. And I'm just gonna read these off because it's pretty amazing. 
So you've been Sports Massage Therapist of the Year. That was probably your first award, mm -hmm. right? And then the FSMTA, which is the Florida State Massage Therapy Association, mm -hmm. and the AMTA, you've gotten presidential awards from Florida and from Utah yeah. in both of those organizations. And then you re also received from the FSMTA the International Achievement Award. You've received Teacher of the Year from the Canadian Massage Conference in the One Concept Group mm -hmm. up there. You've been inducted into the Massage Therapy Hall of Fame. So you are forever in that. And that you've also received the Mer Merit Award from AMTA. So tell what does all this mean to you? You know, these awards, like how does that, you know, I don't mean it ego-wise because, you know, it, I know that that's not important to you. But for me, is there, is, do, do you go back to 1996 when you decided to retire as a paramedic mm -hmm. and throw caution to the wind and, you know, say, okay, I'm going to be in this full time and I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And now you look this career, you know, 20 plus years and you, all these awards and you're like, yeah, I made the right decision. To yeah, do the this. awards are really... An confirmation from your colleagues and your peers that you're you've done a lot of hard work to pioneer this work you know when you when it's outside the room so when we're in that treatment room we're doing all of this but then we're not sharing it and then once they recognize how you're facilitating healing and people who were given no hope to ever get better from the pain they're in all of a sudden the industry and and the medical community starts to look at you and those accolades of awards are simply a confirmation that you're on the right track. They shouldn't be based on ego. You shouldn't think you're better than someone else. I think it's just a confirmation. Man, I'm, I'm going in the right direction. Right. And, and, and what an honor to be given an award by your colleagues and your peers as a teacher of the year. Or, you know, it's an honor. It's a surprise because you're not expect you're just doing the best you can be and being the best you can. And all of a sudden, these accolades come in and go, wow, that's a pretty what, a, what an honor. It gives me goosebumps to think about that, the pure recognition and the, and the opening of windows and doors within the medical community. And, and I liked what some of my colleagues say. I don't want to consider what we do alternative and complementary. I think we are becoming mainstream medicine. You know, whether you're getting a, my wife got a facial. She goes, I felt so pampered. I felt so relaxed. I was so calm and I felt so special. And like, it, it's, it's so all what do we want to feel but love? I mean, if we can make someone feel calm and loved and needed and healing and tap into their gift of, of what they can do on this planet, then what, I mean, I love my job. Yeah, it's and it's, it's not that complicated, it's is it? It's not that complicated. I know, I mean, we're really, human beings healing yeah. really is based on <clears throat> some pretty simple yeah. um, concepts of, oh, healthy touch. Yeah. Oh, help affect the brain and yeah. its chemistry and how it works. Oh, movement. Yeah, let's let's exactly. get them to a place where they can move. Exactly. So I love that. Now, talking to Franny, because you just talked, she had a facial. Um, she is also a massage therapist. You're beautiful by Fran. And I know that she's inspired you greatly. I get, I get choking up. <gasps> I wouldn't be who I am without that woman. I mean, she literally taught and consistently reminds me of the importance of humility you know, CG, you and her have a lot in common. A loving heart, beautiful on the inside and the outside, brilliance, intelligence, leadership skills. And, and if it wasn't for Fran, I wouldn't have, when I met her, she was my only teaching assistant. Now we probably have a hundred and some teaching assistants in 15 countries or a dozen countries. And, and she really wants me to be the best me I can be. So Fran is really, you know, her dad manages the Phillies, Cubs, and Rangers, and they were so humble. He was a charity man. He, he went to hospitals, communities, and, and did charity fundraisers. And, and I still admire to be like her father someday. I'm going to work hard and to fill those. But Fran was more about, you know, if, if there's an evaluation, Jim, could you do this better? You can do this. She made me a better man of God. She made me a more fluent teacher. She made me more passionate, empathetic. And she really leads the way. I mean, I mean, there's so many women behind the scenes, like Allison, my office manager, and Fran. And if it wasn't for Fran being in my life, I would not be who I'm in today. I mean, I could go on. I could write a book about how she's the, you know, the wind between my, be, beneath my wings. How I flourish. Be, when I knew her, we had we had no videos. We had I wasn't I was only in two countries. I mean, I I just I mean, and now we've got multiple things on the plate. She just is a leadership person like you, and I needed someone to lead me. I had passions and visions, and I loved what I did, but I didn't have that, that business skill. So 
And, uh, and, and I love that she tries to remind me the importance of humility and the importance of uh, compassion, the importance of putting, her father always said to his Major League Baseball players, you, you know, put your higher power or God and family first. Put people first and then your passion will manifest. So I'm blessed to have her in my yeah, life. Yeah, it's interesting too because, you know, you say there's always women behind, but there's also men, yeah. right? And so <clears> I think <throat> if I, even if I look at my career or you look at anybody that's more in the public, yeah. public um, um, visually yeah. in the public, there's there's probably 50 people behind them yeah. really that are that make them who they are. Exactly. You know, and so um, I love that you said that, and I just wanted to call out to all of our, you know, more independent women. Yes, yes. there's also men behind yeah, and exactly. all kinds of exactly. folks. So there's someone else that was very instrumental in your career as well. well you know, it's interesting because it's kind of a a really behind the scenes person, and she's a dear friend of both of ours. And Linda Sullyan Wolf, when I was a student, she got me keynote opportunities. She got me involved at the FSMTA. She got me, she introduced me to Dr. Tiffany Fields right when Tiffany was, was on the cover of the either, either Time or Life magazine. And, and Linda saw my vision, and she allowed me to bring in world leaders on cruise ships and do retreats together and learn from the best of the best of the best. She opened the door for me to teach in Scotland. We were doing a fundraiser for S.C. Montague and I met the osteopaths in Scotland. Would you come out and teach? And Linda opens, she opens so many doors for me. Like I would, I mean, there are behind the scenes people that go, they're, they're like, they don't want to be in the limelight. And, and her and friend were opening so many doors, all I had to do was walk through those open doors. So, so Linda Sullivan Wolf is, um, yeah, she just, from student level up, she just really, and Benny Vaughn was another one of those that leader in sports. They just took me under their wings and they started to mentor me and they saw potential. And, and, and I just took that and ran with that. And that, I'm very, very that. blessed. That's really lovely. Yeah. Hey, we're getting towards the end of our interview, but I want to shift gears a little bit from, you know, your specific career in teaching, mm -hmm. because you and a group of colleagues made a very special trip to India. Mm -hmm. And um, I just wanted you to share that trip with our audience about what you guys did down there. And um, yeah, give us the details. You, you know, the Canadian Massage Conference group, uh, Scott and, and, and Monica and everybody, they called me one day and it was good timing because they said, do you want to go to India? We're going to do, we're going to teach at universities and colleges. We're going to launch massage training throughout the country. Um, we're going to do some outreach where we're going to work with people at nursing homes. And we had Tina Allen who did the pediatric baby massage and, and we all volunteered. This was a volunteer. And the timing was perfect because I had just watched a series of Mother Teresa. I thought, what if I could spend one week or two weeks serving like, 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 like she did? And in a small way, in a small way, it was bonding, it was connecting, it was colleague based. And we would go like to nursing homes where people had been left to die. They hadn't been touched for years and years. And we just hold their hand and massage. I mean, I get goosebumps because Scott and Monica and, and the Canadian Massage Concept Group, the one concept group, really, I actually canceled my annual trip to Hawaii, which is my favorite place in the United States to teach, because for some reason, we were called to be there. And when we went, I remember Tina said there were some children, because of their handicaps, or maybe they were autistic or dyslexic or down, they weren't allowed to be touched. And Tina goes, those are the ones that need us. And it triggered everything from Ashley Montague talking about babies lacking human touch and lack of brain development. And so we massaged these children and, and who hadn't been touched. And we massaged, I just, it was like, it, what you get by seeing someone smile and laugh and feel safe human touch. What you get by seeing the, the person in the nursing home going, you care. They don't even know us. And so, I, I have to give a lot of credit. I've taught at Scott's Conference in Canada for every year since it's been in its existence. But to go there with Eric Stevens and Scott and Monica and the whole name and Tina Allen, which are all mentors to me and they're all colleagues of mine. But to go there and, and do some, like my job is to serve. My job is to facilitate healing. My job is to motivate. So to be able to do that on an emotional level was really, I want to do more of that kind of thing. I want to be able to give back to the, what the world's given, given my wife and I, the opportunity to go out and facilitate healing. I love that. James, this has been a really nice time to talk with you. I've really enjoyed it. And we're going to bring you back because you're going to sh do some demonstration of some techniques for us live here at the outside the room um, studio. So I'm super excited about that. And um, 
you have any final words for our I would audience? I like to say, you know, Massage Heights actually hit the jackpot with you. I have to say Aww. to you, I told friends, she goes, you're a little nervous when she took me to the airport. I was like, oh, in some ways, you intimidate me, but in a beautiful way. It's, I have so much respect and so much honor and so much, you've done so much for our profession. And again, you're another one of those behind the scenes people. So to be here in this interview with you as one of my mentors and one of the pioneers and leaders and icons of our profession, it's such an honor and a privilege to do. Thank you so you're much. Welcome. Thank you. Well, you guys, thanks for joining us today. It was so great to have James Wislowski in the room with us. And we'll look forward to his next episode where he's actually going to show some special techniques that you can use in any situations. So stay tuned for the next episode. Well, simply amazing. All I have to say is James Waslowski rocks it. Thanks for joining me today on Outside the Room. I'll look forward to the next time from my heart all the way to your heart. Namaste.